Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. Pastor Lee Eklov tells the following. Around 7 p.m. on the evening of Friday, May 31st, 1985, an F3 magnitude tornado swept through Beaver County, Pennsylvania, just north of Pittsburgh. We were at church for a meeting, and when we got word of the storm, we had no idea how bad it had been. When our meeting came to an end, we headed to the home of some friends. My friend was a surgeon, and when we arrived at his home, one of his colleagues was already at the door. All the physicians in the area were being summoned to the medical center. My surgeon friend ran to his car and left immediately. We stood there wondering what we could do. I thought, I'm a pastor. Maybe I should go to the medical center too. But I didn't want to go. I reasoned I'd probably in the, be in the way. What could I possibly do? They've already got people lined up for these sort of things. But with God's sharp finger in the middle of my back, I, re I reluctantly drove to the hospital. The devastation was worse than I'd imagined. Phone lines were down, traffic was at a standstill, kids were missing, and their parents had no idea where they were. It turned out that the hospital was the only place where worried people could think to go. Many had been injured, three people were dead. The lady in charge of the emergency room would call out from time to time, is there anyone from the Jack Smith family here? Otherwise, folks sat quietly and worried. Having no better idea of what to do, I just started walking up to clusters of people and I would say, I'm a pastor and I wonder if you'd like me to pray for you and your family. Yes, please, they'd say. Others would say that would be great. No one asked me what church I served and no one even hesitated to accept my prayers. As I thought about it later, it hit me that I am an agent of Christ's compassion and love in this world. And that means going where people have needs and are harassed and helpless. And I do this not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer. When others retreat from heartache and sorrow, we step in because we walk with Christ. Epaphroditus was a co-worker with Paul. He was one whom God used as an agent of his compassion and love in this world. Epaphroditus did not retreat, but instead he willingly stepped in to help and do whatever was needed as he served others. And like Timothy, Epaphroditus was a real life example of what it means to have the mind of Christ and to be a humble servant. Philippians 2.25 reads, Yet I supposed it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. Bubba and Jesse were working at a construction company doing some upgrades on a house in a neighborhood, but Bubba with a nail gun accidentally shot a nail through his buddy's boot and subsequently his toe. He called 911 and said, you need to get over here quick. I accidentally shot my buddy Jesse in the foot with a nail gun. He's in a lot of pain. The operator told Bubba she would send someone out right away. Where are you located? Asked the operator. Bubba replied, the address is 522 Eucalyptus Avenue. The 911 operator asked, Yucca what? He said, Eucalyptus Avenue. And she said, Yucca what? Can you spell that for me? There was a long pause, and then Bubba said, If I drag him over to Oak Street, can you meet us there? That reminds me of trying to spell Epaphroditus. <laughs> Learning how to spell uh, Epaphroditus' name isn't as important as learning what the Scriptures teach us about this godly man's life and example. The name Epaphroditus is drawn from the name of the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Epaphroditus means favored by Aphrodite. 
Being named for this mythical and false goddess Aphrodite, Aphrodite, we learned that Epaphrodite was a Gentile born to pagan parents in a pagan environment, and he was also likely educated in Greek culture. Paul was a prisoner in Rome when he wrote this letter, and in verse 19, we read of Paul possibly sending Timothy to Philippi, but that this was dependent on the outcome of Paul's trial. So while Timothy temporarily stayed with Paul in Rome, in verse 25, we find that in the meantime, Paul did choose to send Epaphroditus back to the Philippians. In chapter 4, verse 18 of this letter, Paul wrote, But I have all, and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Epaphroditus had come to Rome to Paul, bearing a love gift of money from the Philippian church. And Paul wrote and told him that, I'm full, I've received it all. The letter of Philippians is a, a receipt of sorts, a thank you note for the gift that they sent. But that the church trusted Epaphroditus with those funds for Paul and for him to carry them over 800 miles from Philippi to Rome teaches us something about this man's character. They trusted him to not pilfer it, steal part of it, or just disappear with it and never return. Because Epaphroditus was a godly man of integrity, the church knew they could entrust, the, entrust their money with him and that he would faithfully carry out this duty to deliver it to Paul, which he did. And now Epaphroditus was sent back to this church by Paul, bearing another treasure of infinite spiritual value, this letter to the Philippians. In the letter he carried back to Philippi, Paul commended Epaphroditus and wrote of his deep appreciation for his service to the Lord in Rome. And he stated three things here that reveal more about this faithful co-worker. Paul referred to him as, first, my brother, second, my fellow worker, and third, my fellow soldier. Like all believers are in Christ, Epaphroditus was Paul's spiritual brother, a fellow child of God, as they were members of the family of God together. It is a miracle of God's grace that we are brothers and sisters. Our identity has changed in Christ. God is our Father. And when we trust Christ, we are born again into His family. And we share a common life and a common home. And we are brothers and sisters and family in Christ. You belong to me, I belong to you, and we all belong to each other in the Lord. Now, Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Jew. Timothy, mentioned in this chapter, was half Jew, half Gentile. Epaphroditus was a full Gentile. Now, born into God's family, having trusted Christ as Savior, Epaphroditus was a member of the body of Christ, and he was Paul's brother in Christ, and he is our brother in Christ. Believers are bound together in a brotherhood. Next, Paul calls Epaphroditus my companion in labor. Not only was Epaphroditus a brother, but he was also a fellow worker in the ministry. Epaphroditus was committed to the furtherance of the gospel and the work that is associated with that mission. The words companion and labor is one Greek word in the original, the word synergos, and we get our English word synergy from it. There was a synergy between Paul and Epaphroditus in their purpose and work ethic as they labored together for the cause of Christ. The term conveys the idea of an affectionate partnership and not just an impersonal, official kind of relationship. It refers to one who is a team player. Calling Epaphroditus a companion in labor shows that he was a man who could work with others. It is one thing for believers to work independently, having everything their own way. It is much more difficult and requires humility to work with others. 
and in that to allow for individual differences and to submit one's own desires and opinions for the good of the whole. And Epaphroditus was that kind of man, one who could humbly submit and work well with others in the work of the ministry. Not only was Epaphroditus a brother and a companion in labor, but he was also a fellow soldier. The apostle looked at Epaphroditus not as a subordinate, but in humility by the apostle, as a fellow spiritual warrior in the cause of Jesus Christ. Being a fellow soldier teaches of Epaphroditus' joint struggle with Paul against a common spiritual enemy. That enemy is the devil and his angels, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Epaphroditus took his place beside Paul in the spiritual battle to fight the good fight of the faith and to war a good warfare. It's been said well that the Roman legions struck fear into the hearts of the enemy as they advanced toward them in an unbroken line, shoulder to shoulder, with shields before them and spears in hand and shouting a song of victory. If Christians would do likewise, it would terrify all the hosts of evil. Epaphroditus was very much like the builders of the wall in Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. Because of the constant danger of attack by their enemies, the Word of God says that they built that wall with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. And that's the picture of Epaphroditus. With a tool in one hand, he was a companion in labor, and he had a sword in the other because he was a fellow soldier. The first three titles introduced by my pertain to Epaphroditus' relationship to Paul. The latter two introduced by your pertain to his relationship with the Philippians. Paul told the Philippians that he was your messenger. The Greek word for messenger is apostolos or apostle. This does not mean that Epaphroditus was an apostle or that he had that gift. Apostle simply means a sent one. And Paul is using that term to show how Epaphroditus was a sent one, sent by the Philippian church on a mission to Rome as their representative, sent to deliver their gift of money to Paul. In this, as Paul wrote, he ministered to my wants or my needs. But Epaphroditus was also sent by the Philippian church to minister to Paul's needs in the sense that the Philippians provided Epaphroditus himself indefinitely as a servant functioning officially on their behalf to assist Paul in the ministry during his house arrest in Rome. And Epaphroditus willingly gave up his own desires to help the apostle in his need. Epaphroditus was a layman in the Philippian church. He held no office. He wrote no books. He did not establish or lead any great enterprise for God. Epaphroditus was a worker, a messenger, and a servant for his Lord. No task was too menial for him. No assignment was too little for him to accept, and no risk was too great for him to take. He was willing to do whatever was asked of him, quietly and inconspicuously. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And like our Savior, Epaphroditus was self-forgiving, for self-forgetting, he humbled himself, he became a servant, he looked not on his own things, but also on the things of others. And as a result, like God exalted his son who humbled himself and became a servant, giving him a name which is above every name, God exalted this humble servant, Epaphroditus, by recording his name and his faithfulness in his word, which we will remember and cherish 
and treasure and read for all eternity. Philippians 2, 26 and 27 read, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Leith Anderson tells the following, I've been blessed by some truly humble, loving people. One I remember most is Joan Hollister Gilbert. Joan was a delightful person who had a long, difficult, and courageous battle against cancer. During her illness, her husband Jack was diagnosed with cancer, and she had to deal with that and eventually with Jack's death. A few years later, when Joan was dying with just a few days left in her life, she invited Charlene and me to come and sit by her bedside. She said she knew she was going to die, and she talked about it. Most people, in my experience, choose not to do that. She said she wasn't afraid. She said she was excited about entering the presence of her Savior. But that was by far the shortest part of the conversation. Most of the time, she talked about people for whom she was concerned. She talked about us and our children. She talked about her children and the children of others. I found out that on that day and the day before and the day after, leading right up to her death, she invited a whole list of people to come to her bedside so she could talk to them before she died. Those who could not come, she talked with on the telephone. If anyone ever had a right to be self-concerned, and if ever there was a time when she had every justification to be primarily focused upon herself, it was Joan and it was then. But she lived out humility in the mind of Christ. She cared more about others and their needs than she cared about herself and her own needs. That's the way it is with Christ. And that's the way it should be with us. And that's the way it was for Epaphroditus. Paul wrote that Epaphroditus longed after you all. Paul sent Epaphroditus back to the Philippians because he greatly missed all of them and longed to see them. And he was full of heaviness, meaning that he was distressed and full of anguish. The reason he longed to see them, the reason he was heavy and distressed emotionally, was that they had heard that he had been sick. He was full of heaviness, not due to his own sickness, but rather it caused his heart to ache to think that he had been a cause of worry to them. Epaphroditus was not concerned about himself. He was concerned about the church in Philippi because they were worried about him. And that's a selfless mindset. Epaphroditus didn't want them in any way to feel bad or rebuke themselves for sending, them, for sending him on this journey during which he had become sick. And Paul points out in verse 27 that the Philippians had good reason to be concerned about his health. He wrote that Epaphroditus was sick and very, very nearly died. The words nigh unto means next door. And as one commentator put it, Epaphroditus and death were next-door neighbors. Taking a trip of over 800 miles, which took at least six weeks, it may be that the rigorous journey from Philippi to Rome might have weakened him, or it might have been due to overexertion in the work after he got there. But Paul states plainly in verse 30 that because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. Exactly why or how or when he fell ill, we don't know for certain, but we do know that it was serious. So why didn't Paul just heal him? Paul healed a lame man in Lystra in Acts 14. Handkerchiefs and aprons Paul used were utilized for the healing of the sick in Ephesus in Acts 19. Paul healed many on the island of Malta in Acts 28 on his way to Rome. If the gift of healing was still in operation, we can be sure Paul would have healed his dear brother Epaphroditus. 
But following the close of the book of Acts, when the transition from God's program with Israel to God's program with the body of Christ was complete, and the revelation given to Paul was complete, we see at that point that the gift of healing had ceased to operate along with the other supernatural sign gifts of the Acts period. Paul could not heal Epaphroditus here. He could not heal Timothy of his stomach problem and other infirmities, as Paul wrote about in 1 Timothy 5.23. Paul could not heal Trophimus in 2 Timothy 4.20. He could not heal them because the gift of healing had ceased. Today, under grace, God no longer gives the gift of healing as He did in the past. And God is not using faith healers today to perform miraculous healings. But having said all that, God can still heal. God is still the great physician. God is sovereign. God is able. And He sometimes does raise up the sick in answer to our prayers. And He still can heal under grace if it is His will. We see here that God intervened and had mercy on Epaphroditus and healed him. But God did not heal Paul of his thorn in the flesh. He did not heal Timothy of his stomach ailment or Trophimus of his illness. God heals according to his perfect will. And while God does not always heal, God's grace is always sufficient. As the Lord told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and his strength is always and still made perfect in our weakness. Paul wrote that God had mercy on Epaphroditus and healing him and raising him back up to sound physical health. And Paul says that God had mercy on him also, Paul, that is. God's mercy to Epaphroditus was also God's mercy to Paul. And Paul was thankful for the recovery of his faithful co-worker in Christ. If he had died, Paul says, sorrow would have been heaped upon sorrow, and his grief would have been great and lasting because a valued brother, worker, and soldier for Christ was no longer on this earth and his sorrow would have been increased also with the knowledge that his life had been lost in endeavoring to do him good. Philippians 2, 28 to 30 says, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. And Paul's selflessness, having the best interests of the Philippian church and Epaphroditus at heart, he sent Epaphroditus home, even though Paul could have used them in Rome. But recognizing Epaphroditus' desire to go home and the Philippians' concern for him, with haste, the apostle arranged his trip back to Philippi. Epaphroditus' return was Paul's idea. That's what Paul's making clear here. Epaphroditus didn't ask for it, and Paul recognizes that the church didn't ask for it. But Paul desired to bring both of them joy. And Paul says that their joy in seeing him again would make his sorrow in sending him away less sorrowful and more bearable. And so it is that when we concern ourselves with the joy of others, we find joy for ourselves. Paul believed that the Philippians would rejoice when Epaphroditus returned home. However, he was concerned at the possibility that a few might see his return as a failure of his mission and of the purpose for which the church had sent him to Rome. They might have expected him not only to deliver the financial gift, but to aid Paul, make himself available and useful to the apostle for the duration of Paul's imprisonment. And thus, they might have accused him or thought of him or murmured about him 
being a quitter. To protect Epaphroditus against any thoughts or accusations along this line, Paul painted a very clear picture of the blessing this man had been to Paul in Rome and the reason Paul sent him back. He expected the church to hold this man in high regard because he even almost lost his life as he served the Lord on behalf of the church in Philippi. He had represented them well, so well. Thus, Paul encouraged them to receive him in the Lord with all gladness. Welcome him home with open arms and great joy. And this true servant of Christ ultimately had been restored to them by God who had mercy on him. Paul further tells them to honor this man, hold this man in high esteem. The reason they needed to honor him was that with total disregard for his own welfare and for no other reason than love, he had selflessly put his life on the line for the work of Christ. Too many people not worthy to be held in high esteem are held in high esteem in this world. We need to esteem the ones that God holds in high esteem. Epaphroditus was like his Savior. To not regard your life, to humbly give your all in the service of others, is to have the mind of Christ. Because our Savior regarded not his own life. Our Savior gave his all. Our Savior gave his life for us on the cross that we might live and be saved from our sins. And so, to those like Epaphroditus, who would serve the Lord and live for the Lord with that kind of passion, in selfless sacrifice for the good of others and the salvation of souls regardless of the cost. They deserve our utmost respect and they should be held up and highly honored. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society. P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.